Mishka Shabali is catching up with friends who are arguably more talented than him. Ahoy, hoy. Uh, hey, what's up, gang? It's Mishka, um, again, doing the podcast thing that happens in the Mishka Shabali podcast. Um, the, that's two out of three. We'll handle the third one later. The uh, I mean, good, good Stuff in the Pipeline, a podcast with uh, writer Laura McCown, and uh, and I'm going to scramble and, uh, and record a couple more here. The I have Avery Moore on deck. And uh, I don't know, reaching out to a couple of folks I'm excited about. Um, I feel like I got to keep you posted on the latest uh, sort of updates here. The um, my I think I think I mentioned that I'm down to eight fingernails now. And it's so weird. The like on my pinky finger, it's just the the fingernail that I was worried about just fell out completely and it's such a weird sensation just sort of walking around with this part of your finger exposed that should not be exposed. The like just it doesn't hurt anymore, but touching anything just feels far too intimate, like somebody is licking your eyeball. And now I can't come any other way. Um, that's real gross. Uh, what else? The oh, a local dude who. I bought a telly from years ago, uh, stopped by the other day to pick up a copy of the new book, uh, which I should plug here at some point. Um, and man, we had the nicest moment. He sort of mentioned that he'd been listening to the podcast and, uh, you know, he wanted to buy the book. And so we just sort of connected in an organic way of me buying a guitar off him on Craigslist or whatever. And then he has tuned in for the podcast and he wanted to sort of come over to express in person his concern for me (laughs) because I've spoken uh, openly and honestly about having a real rough time these last couple of years. Um, So that was uh, incredibly sweet and also weird because uh, men never express emotion and uh the and i feel like i need to assure everybody that um the dark times are coming because i have had a string of good days it's uh yeah it's weird i my therapist kind of dumped me and then i kind of dumped no, dump me i'll dump you and the and i've been feel, feeling real good since then so i don't know it's it's bizarre um I'm also feeling good today because I just listened back to this uh, this podcast with my friend Roberto, and fuck, it just made me miss him so much. The we had such a good time when he was here. The he's um, you know, a, a brilliant dude, a very thoughtful guy. I met him through Lanigan. We talk about um, a lot about Mark and our sort of our connection with him, our relationship with him. Um, the super intelligent and the. You know, one of the things I really appreciate about him is that he's so fucking smart and he's so intuitive that he makes me sound better. He makes me sound like a good guy. So uh, tune in for uh, for that conversation. Also, I will be posting our first Patreon only um, podcast, a little mini podcast that Roberto and I tacked on at the end. He was staying at Lanigan's house at one point. Lanigan kept loaded guns there. And Roberto shot a fucking hole in the fucking wall. And uh, if you want to hear that conversation, you got to fucking pay for it. Uh, You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. Um, But uh, patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. And for now, enjoy this conversation with Roberto Bentevena, the uh, screenwriter for... Book of Gucci. Book of Gucci. God damn it. The elephant comes from my sister who, uh, when we were kids, uh, you you know, when you were a kid, you have like a favorite color and a favorite animal and a a favorite everything. Mm -hmm. And her favorite animal was uh, um, elephants. And... Uh, she and I, you know, 
no, I was going to say we had a big falling out. Our relationship when we were kids was mostly falling outs. And then after I got sober, I decided that I wanted to, um, not just to apologize, but to communicate to her that like I was committed to having a friendship with her. Yeah. You know, so I got a big dumb tattoo, Mm -hmm. um, you know, is that the animal? Are we on, by the way? Oh yeah, we're oh, okay. the Is that the animal that she uh, identifies with? And that's yeah, it, yeah. Elephants were her favorite animal. I think, I think I was, I think I was a frog. Mm-hmm. I think I was a frog man. Yeah. The that was my. What was your favorite animal well, when you were a child? Uh, after the zoo visit in San Diego, I'd have to say the the tapir. Yeah, the, is it taper or tapir? I'm going to say it wrong. Tapir, like, say, cash, like cashmere. <laughs> yes, the it's the a, Led Zeppelin classic tapir. Yeah, it's a, yeah, they're they're long forgotten classic tapir. Um, but yeah, those things are fucking insane, man. They're uh, they're very. They're, I can't tell if they're very cute or just incredibly uh, uh, bizarre and terrifying uh, evolutionary mistakes. I feel like there's so there's all these like uh, a list African mammals like the you know the uh, giraffe and the elephant and the antelope and and then there's the sort of b list uh <laughs> mammals that are all in between those where yeah. you're like oh did you see uh you know the whatever um and when you when you look at that when you see these animals the you're like oh yeah fucking evolution because that's in between you know uh a tapir taper yeah the it's it's it feels like it's in between an elephant and like something the else and the unfinished draft and uh, yeah an, an anteater or a pit yeah the it's yeah, yeah the version 1.0 they were still figuring out where, the, where to put the the pieces and then people are like oh no god made everything like, right and then a hyena <laughs> comes around and yeah eats its asshole it's asshole <laughs> That's that's where we're gonna start. Right that's there. it. Well, the, yeah. that's the podcast right there. The, um, let's do this. Let's start here. Um, I you know I want to talk about uh, your writing, what you've been up to, the the sort of arc of your creative career. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's start with Mark. Okay. The how did you meet Mark? The arc of Mark. Yes. I met Mark. Covenant. I met Mark. Uh, let's see. Uh, he was forty nine because he was about to turn fifty. Uh, so that would have been how many years ago? Eight years ago. Eight yeah. years ago. Yeah. And it's a really funny story because I um, I was a fan. I mean, I was a huge fan of his music. And when I came to the U.S. at nineteen uh, to study film, the the album that accompanied me was Field Songs. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how albums can, you know, they're markers for your life, for for great moments, for bad moments, for everything. And so I associate basically adulthood in a way, like me, you know, leaving my parents behind, going to the U.S. with that album. And um, I used to put all, all of his songs onto my short films because my short films were so shit. And music has this incredible uh, power in, in movies of making terrible shit look less terrible because, you know. Uh-huh. it's beautiful music so you can slap it on anything and it kind of gives it this like ethereal aura um and, but so, and conversely if you're watching something and you turn the sound off yeah it's everything stripped away and, right you know if if it's still good with the sound off i think you, you've found something it's you know? true yeah although I, I do think that uh the emotional impact in movies most of the time is is musical i think that if you watch huh. a scene from a movie that makes you cry yeah. Without sound and without music, I don't know that you'd have the same reaction. I think it's it's eighty percent is the music. Uh, you can play an Ennio Morricone score, and I will start, you know, crying. Yeah. But if I if I just watch the scene from Cinema Paradiso without music, I'm just gonna go, okay, where's where's yeah. the music? You know. Yeah. But anyway, so um, so yeah, so I listened to his music and and I always followed him. Through the, throughout the years, you know, like every time mm-hmm. he released something, I would always listen to it. And then when I started uh, writing and, and making movies myself, mostly writing them, um, I really wanted him to be in a movie that I had written called The Eel. Because uh, it's uh, sort of like an acid western. Mm-hmm. And he had such a great look. And he had yeah. sort of a gunslinger attitude about him, you know. Yes. So through my agent and his agent and that whole sort of thing that, you know, people do to like legitimize themselves rather yeah. than just emailing him out of the fucking blue <laughs> which is what i did which is what you did which is probably what i should have done but um we went through the hoops and then 
he read the script and he was like, I love this. Let's meet. And so we met in a cafe in Silver Lake and I was vaping and he always <laughs> gave me shit for it. He's like, he was like, uh, good thing you're not an asshole because when I saw you fucking vaping, <laughs> I was like, who is why, this guy? Why are you vaping, bro? Yeah. Why are you vaping, bro? And so, um, and so we had this beautiful meeting and, you know, he rolled up, of course, he rolled up in the uh, Magnum. The hearse. Yeah. Uh, yeah the Magnum XL <laughs> SRT. <laughs> and, and from that moment on, like the next night, he invited me over to his house. I was dating this girl at the time and we went over and, you know, we had fried chicken with him and Shelly and I met all the animals. And from that moment on, it became this uh, incredibly intense, beautiful friendship where, you know, at one point we would almost hang out every day or communicate every day or you know he read all of my stuff and the movie never happened which is very sad but the the movie didn't happen but he was always you know um supporting me and and really believing in me mm -hmm. which i think uh when you're uh, not believing in yourself having someone of that uh artistry and uh someone that you really admire that can make the difference between giving up and and keep and keeping going you know it it really gives you a stamp of legitimacy you know the uh it, getting that getting peer to peer support you know the to to do a show and make um the bachelorette party or the people in the front row or the hardcore fans laugh means almost nothing yeah. when you can make the other comics laugh right. then you're like fuck yeah i'm on to something oh dude that's a beautiful but, way of putting it yeah. you know but but um you know, I mean, we were talking about this earlier that that Mark was a hero. He wasn't a peer, right? You know, so it's it, um, it's like making your dad laugh or something like that. But it, you know, it was the. I mean, I've talked about this at length, but like getting him to laugh was, or or getting a kind word from him. I remember, you know, he was he was fucking giving me grief about songwriting, and he was like, you, "You do this wrong, you do this wrong, you do this wrong, and you do this wrong." Just you know, just write a song and just just say the fucking thing. Just say how you feel. You know, the I was like, "Well, that's you know, it's always corny." The just, just sort of raw sentimentality like that. I've always got to you know, there's got to be a joke or wordplay or whatever. And he was like, "No, fuck that bullshit. Just yeah. you know, cut to the heart of the matter." And then I did. I you know, I try. I sat there and I wrote a song about my uncle who had passed um, a couple years earlier. And I sent him a phone demo and he was like, um, he was like, see, you know, mm. the, I knew you had it in you. I, I, I gave you specific instructions, do this, do this, do this, do this. And 45 minutes later, you write a perfect song and deliver it to me. Oh, let's let's record it. Yeah. Amazing. You know, the, and I mean, just telling you that story, I, I feel like two inches taller, just, yeah. you know, to, um, I, I did not get a lot of kind words out of him, mm. you know, but to, to have that, the, but I, I think every, every kind word he said to me, every supportive word he said you, to me, you cherished it. the, yeah, I, 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 you know, I carry all of them. Yeah. The, I always make this joke to people because I, you know, with buying and selling cars and buying and selling guitars and stuff like that, I, I end up doing a lot of like large ca cash transactions in person and the, People are always so sketchy about it now of like, oh, you know, meet me in the Safeway, you know, parking lot or, you know, I'm like, no, fucking just come to my house and fucking pick the thing up. Like, yeah. you know, the, and I always make the joke, you know, that like I've, um, bought enough drugs off of Craigslist to <laughs> be able to make a call pretty quickly as to whether I can trust someone or whether not. Whether they're going to murder you or not. Yeah. And Lanigan was that to the nth degree yeah. that he would just sort of do a read on you. On people. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I always felt very, um, you know, very grateful that, that I made the cut and yeah. and that he opened up to me in a way that, um, you know, that was quite humbling. And uh, and it's always, it's you know, you were talking about making your dad laugh. And it's always a little bit strange when your hero... Uh, opens up to his own insecurities and his own uh, doubts and and shortcomings and whatever else, and um, you realize that that he's human. Of course, I knew that. I mean, I knew that he had all these crazy life experiences. But even something as simple as uh, confessing that he was he was upset or disappointed that people weren't showing up to some of his gigs. Um, I remember thinking that really hurt me 
actually like yeah. knowing how brilliant he was that really it really hurt to hear him say that because uh and then of course he'd pick himself up again you know uh, he'd go somewhere else and there was a ton of people that adored him so it was just a question of location um in, in europe he had a completely different uh reception than than in some of the gigs he was playing in the, in the u.s you know and he always said that so watching that chet baker documentary yeah and the and- Chet fucking Baker, yep. you know, and he's at, you know, in the sort of final scenes, he's at this festival in, uh, in Europe and he's like, you know, these fucking people are talking. These people like just won't listen, you know, the, yeah. and there's live recordings of Towns Van Zandt with people like squawking and talking and chattering and giggling over him, you know, the, and speaking as someone who has people talk through my sets all the fucking time it's i i do feel a, a certain like selfish amount of comfort in that like oh, yeah. you talked over towns van zandt and now you'll talk over me right you know the they're not talking over maroon five i'll tell you that <laughs> fuck you <laughs> <laughs> the but also it's um it is you know it, it's tragic you know the i I, I, you know, I, I really, I feel like Mark never got his due, or at least in America, you know, while he was alive. And then, of course, you know, we do that thing that the moment a person dies, they're I like, know, it's you know, pathetic. Um, just heap all these accolades on yeah. them. We need to learn to, um, <laughs> to, to worship people while they're alive, you know, yeah. or to not wait until somebody's dead to, um, to dive into their work. Well, and also, I mean, if you're if you're a, a, a connoisseur or or whatever of of music of that time, you know he was on another level. Um, yeah. Some of the people, and, and you know, without making any names, there was a few people that he loathed <laughs> that became incredibly successful from you know that circle, mm-hmm. and um, and you kind of just go like, you know, what what makes them successful to that level? Whereas you know, Mark always had to kind of hustle to to get his uh, you know his gospel out. Um, and it's you know it's like anything it's uh, I mean there's so many, it's like Van Gogh right I mean never saw the painting in his lifetime and became the most successful painter ever after he was dead I mean I don't think Mark was at that level like I think there was a lot of even when, you know within his lifetime there was a lot of people kind of already hero worshiping him and so you know I I think too that Mark was a difficult man. Mm-hmm. You know, and, you know, I, I did a great podcast yesterday with uh, Joe Cardamone and, uh, he, you know, he was talking about being on tour with, with with Lanigan and he was like, yeah, the Seattle show, Mark didn't even show up for that. Like we yeah. headlined that show. That's right. He told me about you know? <laughs> the no show gigs. <laughs> the uh, and um, but we romanticized that. Yeah. The and dude, it's so much easier to deal with you. <laughs> like, I, I, I think it's so admirable that you're uh, such an affable person, and you're so um, easy to talk to, easy to get along with. But you know, your sort of exhibit A that you don't have to be an, an asshole or a piece of shit or a oh, junkie thanks, or an outsider yeah. to make to make art. Well, yeah, I have my own my own internal conflict. I just don't. Ex- Externalize it. Yeah, I mean, I try not to make it uh, part of my of my person of my uh, of how I present myself to people. You know, I kind of keep that stuff private. But um, yeah, my I mean, the the version of Mark that I got was the uh, the sweetest, kindest, gentlest person I've met. Really, and, ever. and I will always resent you for that. <laughs> you, you, and fucking Joe Cardamone, like, Dude, the, like but that's I got big, all the shit. Man. I never worked with him though. That's I think the big difference. Yeah. Like I, you know, I um, we talked a lot about music and movies and art, but it, it was never as a collab as collaborators, and mm. um, uh, and I think that really kind of freed him up to to just let go with me and and just kind of relax uh-huh. versus feeling like he was putting up a an image or that he was that he needed to somehow control the outcome a little bit more you know what i mean i you know i talked about this with josh mallerman you know and one of the one of the tricky things one of the frustrating things about having a you know um having a life in in public is that um we put 
people put pressure on us or we put pressure on ourselves to always be in character. Yeah. You know, there's a, that great um, poem, uh, War All the Time by Bukowski. And, you know, he talks about like, oh, the neighbors see me like, you know, just, you know, just an old man like watering his flowers. Mm. And, you right, know, right. The, um, well, that's like, I got that version of Mark. Yeah. I got the Mark watering the flowers. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and talking to the dogs. And yeah. Like, that was so Of course, that I got really the other beautiful. version too, but. But not to the extent I think that some of the uh, some of his friends or or you or I absolutely got the war all the time version a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, you know, he was also you know is also incredibly um, could be incredibly tender and incredibly sweet. You know the yeah. and uh, I don't know. I remember I remember getting yelled at more though. <laughs> Actually, I I should go back through the the my emails and text messages and stuff like that. The one of the things that I will say in um in praise of you know being a drunk or an addict um for a, a large portion of your life mm-hmm. is you get really fucking good at apologizing. Right. Like I can write an apology. Oh, that, you that become will look, a, it'll uh, look like a wedding cake. The, the Caravaggio you know? of, uh, of yeah. apologies. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And Mark could have fucking could apologize the paint off a van. Oh, like dude. He well, was, he, speaking the... of van, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, apology uh, that, went, that went public that, uh, you know, he made to the Screaming Trees guitar player. Yeah. That was that was a uh, that was amazing uh, uh, because it kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, I don't think he ever said a single good thing about that band or about that that specific dude. And then you know that email. I mean, that text message was like you know this incredibly uh, forgiving, self forgiving thing that he did. And it it's tricky, you know, because while we were doing the book, I at you know multiple times I was like man you're going pretty hard on this guy you know the yeah. um and uh and i was like you know maybe you know you were you guys were young you were fucked up you know egos and alcohol and and he was like no man i gotta like i gotta fucking, i gotta get it out yeah yeah and the and get it out write it yeah but then don't publish it you know the and i i fought with him about that and at the end of the day it was his call yeah. and um I was just thinking, by the way, like uh, I drove out uh, fucking, I don't know, like six years ago. I went from L.A. to New York and uh, I drove out to San Angelo in Texas. And I and I texted Mark and I was like, I'm in this little town. It's pretty cool. It's like this, you know, sort of artsy, craftsy uh, little town in Texas. And he goes, that's where my former guitar player lives. <laughs> <laughs> and then And then for a second, he was like, I should probably reach out to him and say hi. Like th- for, th- for some reason, he saw it as like a sign. You uh-huh. know that I was texting him from San Angelo, and um, so yeah. But um, anyway, I mean, my my friendship is something with him is something that um, yeah, I'll, I'll cherish it forever, man. I mean, it was uh, you know, it was very special to me yeah, from the beginning to the end and beyond. It's it's funny, you know, from you know, I did a solo um, solo podcast. I talked to Alec Bemis, uh, who uh, one of the founders of Brassland with uh, the National. Um, yeah. he he got to be a huge Lanigan fan. Um, it's always nice when you meet people and they know who he is. It's like it's like you're a member of a cult. Ab- absolutely. The and you know and that was one of the things I you know I talked about with Joe yesterday is that the um, grief is horrible. Grief is the fucking worst. And but it has come with this um, you know strange gift. Of of connecting the, with his, I mean, talking to Joe yesterday, it was like meeting somebody who's into the same fucking type of pornography that you are, or something yeah. like that. Or like, <laughs> have you seen that one? Like, oh, you know, yeah, the, yeah. I like that part. You know, the the, one, and, and yeah. we, you know, when when have you seen that one? The one with the dwarves and the, oh, amazing and the it's incredible, yeah. Uh, yeah, the I my VHS tape is like all blurry in that part from like hitting the like pause <laughs> rewind pause rewind. <laughs> I'm impressed you still watch VHS. I'm a purist. I mean, the, it's you know the analog pornography. It's like you know it has that weight to it. Yeah, you know? <laughs> nobody ever went back to VHS saying like you know the way that they did with vinyl. You know because oh the fucking nostalgia. It just looks like shit. Will. I think everybody just accepts the VHS looks like shit and that there's nothing good about it. You know? I, dude, I watched the. Um, the Chicago Bulls documentary, The Last Dance. Yeah. Not a sports fan, not a basketball fan. 
fucking incredible. You watched it on VHS? The well, I mean, it, it was shot in whatever the nineties. Oh yeah. So it's you know, and it was you know basketball games. So the quality is like yeah, just you know, you if you like squint, it sharpens up a little bit, you know, <laughs> and uh, the but you know that was just it was I loved it. I've never had fucking sports make me make me cry, but it, I I might make my students watch it this year just to just to be like um, to push past all the sort of like literary pretension. Yeah, of, I'm going to make you watch a sports thing, you know, and because it's about storytelling at the end of the day, and it's about storytelling and character development and editing. And I mean, sports movies. Uh, I remember somebody was asking me like, "Do you want to do a sports movie?" And I. I think my initial reaction was fuck no because I just I thought they meant like something really jockey and kind of whatever. But there's some amazing movies. I mean, if you think Raging Bull is a fucking oh, a sports God. movie. Yeah. You yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so it's uh, The Wrestler is a sports movie. I mean, it's like <laughs> The Color of Money. I mean, there's some great movies that are you don't even think of them as sports movies, you know? I remember uh, towards the end of my drinking career, I was um <laughs> We were, I think we were flying to the UK to go on tour and it was, you know, I was in a band with one of my oldest friends and he was like, oh, you should watch The Wrestler. You'll yeah. like that. And I watched it and, uh, and he was like, so what do you think of it? And I was like, I, I don't know, man. Like it fucking reminded me too much of my life. And he looked at me, <laughs> he looked at me and he said, your life doesn't have a redemptive part. Uh- <laughs> That's great. Or a daughter. Yeah. Well, Not that you know of. Yeah. Yeah. The- she might show up. Um. Let's talk about your the arc of your career and where Let's you were, it. where you met Mark, and yeah. I don't know the disappointment of not having the eel get made. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, to be an artist, you sign up to be a professional failure, right? And most of the things, most of the seeds don't take root. That's true, and and we fucking carry that around with us and well, it I sucks. Well I think in, in in screenwriting or in filmmaking probably more than in any other art form. Yeah. Um the only other the only other um job uh, that I think is kind of similar to screenwriting is uh, architecture. And I recently huh. read a, a graphic novel called Asterios Polyp by Dave Matsukelli. Okay. Uh, it's a great graphic novel and it's about an architect they're called paper architects. Uh, people who basically uh, draw buildings that never get made, uh-huh. that never get built, and I thought the sc- the screenwriting in a way is kind of similar. You know, it's like you can write all these movies um, and then realize that they don't uh, they don't exist, and it's this kind of bizarre. You're in this bizarre purgatory creatively. Um, yeah, I um, I have to say, but we should say that I did get finally get one movie made. Yes, the. What, we'll get to that. Okay. Slow down. Let's, we're going to take our time going through the, the yeah. quagmire of failure and rejection Just, right. and disappointment. We're swimming through the swamp <laughs> yeah. to get to the, to the ocean. The, um, I wrote uh, a screenplay at one point, and the, you know, when I was sort of publishing all the, um, the stories with Amazon, and I met with my agent about it, and, you know, and, and she liked it, and she was like, you know, I'm willing to take it around. And she turned to me and she said, but I want you to know that... <laughs> Most books, yeah, when they get sold, they become books. Most screenplays, when they get sold, do not become screen or be not do not become movies. movies. That's very true, and it scared the shit out of me. Yep. I was like, yeah, no, I'll fucking stick to writing books. Yeah, the- yeah, yeah. I mean, in order for a movie to happen, there has to be all these elements, and and a lot of it is out of your hands. I mean, I just had something happen to this movie that I wrote uh, that we had uh, a great, great budget two great actors and the director just dropped out because he was uh he was scared <laughs> because he was basically overwhelmed and couldn't do it and uh you know and that's that's one person who basically uh single-handedly destroyed <laughs> this Torpedoed amazing thing that we project. were going to do yeah yeah so yeah and that had nothing to do with me i mean you just have to i don't know if you have to become numb to it because i can't become numb to it i mean i'm always going to yeah put a hundred percent of myself into into my work but i think you you just you just have to keep bulldozing your way through um and and just pick yourself up again i mean that's i think that's the most important part of it is is resilience when i was a kid brazilians brazilians (laughs) brazilians also yeah the um 
you need to be re- very resilient and have no pubic hair. Correct. The, yes, and a huge, beautiful booty, <laughs> the, uh, which I have. <laughs> working and, on it, and I have as well. We're, yeah, we're not doing videos, we're so fuck it. We both have amazing asses. <laughs> it's yeah, it's true. The uh, <laughs> I saw John uh, John Patrick Shanley uh, came to speak at the University of Colorado when I was there, and he t- he spoke about screenwriting. And one of the things that he said is that you know to to write a screenplay and have it made into a movie, it's sort of like they take your screenplay and they clip it up to a clothesline, mm-hmm. and then they take a shotgun mm-hmm. and just blast it, and <laughs> you're like, what the fuck? Yeah. But if you write a good screenplay, then you can still look at the the shreds hanging on the line and be like, oh, yeah, there. It's wow, right. it that's quite a, that's there. Quite a uh, cynical way of, of looking at it. But I guess it's true. If if you're not in control creatively of it, then that shotgun blast, 100%. I mean, that's inevitable because you're giving your script over to someone else to make, uh, whether it's a director, studio, producer. Um, but, you know, if you if you write it and you direct it and maybe even produce it, then... I think you have a much bigger ch- uh, chance of that being the movie being what you hopefully intended it for it to be. And if it sucks, at least you can say it sucks because of you. Yeah. Um, if it doesn't come out good and you wrote it thinking it was going to be good, I think that's that's very sad because you'll always live with that question in your mind. You know, like would I have done a better job? Would I have uh, made those mistakes? Yeah. The um, I, I feel like those two experiences, the thing with John Patrick Shanley and then with my agent, the scared me off screenwriting for good. Yeah. The, but I think that's effective, too, because people are always like, oh, you need to encourage writers. And I disagree. I, 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 think, I agree. I, I agree I, with you about disagreeing. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I do. Uh, about discouraging writers? Yeah. I think, yeah. That because well, I, by the way, that's that goes for anyone. Like if somebody shows up with a, you know, with a fucked up car. And they're like, I'm going to be a mechanic. Look look at the great job that I did. I'm going to be like, no, fucking <laughs> take yeah. it to a proper garage. You don't know what yeah. the fuck you're doing. And it's the same thing with uh, with art, with, with music or, or writing or anything, painting. I think, of course, there's a, there's a fine line because, you know, it's a question of taste. You might not respond to something and then realize. And that's happened to me all the time. I mean, look at reggaeton, the musical genre. Yeah. I fucking hate reggaeton with every fiber of my body. It happens to be the most successful genre in the world right now, probably. Jesus, I really? Mean, definitely the most successful out of Latin America. And, um, you know, there's there's people that actually think it's it's valid musically. They're like, oh, it has its roots in African whatever it is. And, and that's the only thing that I like about it is the African beat. But everything else is garbage. But fuck, man, it's huge. You it's know? the you know, my dad would always say shit about hip hop. You know where he was like, you know, it's um, you know, I don't get it. You know that it all sounds the same. You yeah. know the and it's like, well, that's what your dad said about rock and roll. So you, and, are you saying we're just old farts and we don't get it because we're old? But we have delicious asses. That, well, that's, that's everything. I don't the, know. Um, I'm waiting I mean, I, for I think part of it is just the. Um, I don't speak Italian. Yeah. The when I'm in Italy, it all sounds the same to me, mm-hmm. and it's because I don't speak the language. The granted, the and fucking. If you're listening to this, fucking light me up if I'm wrong. I feel like reggaeton is like a pretty homogenous genre. I think as as popular music develops, the niche, you know, the niche genres are getting smaller and smaller and more restrictive and more restrictive. Yeah. The, whereas you know, rock and roll is like basically anything, you know, uh, the one four five with a, a rollicking backbeat, which could be fuck kind of fucking anything. Though. I'm waiting for for the Kendrick Lamar. Mar of reggaeton to show up, or the tribe called Quest of reggaeton, someone that's going to take take it and and do something really spectacular with it, and um, and and that could be cool, you know. But yeah, because you know, if you think of rap, like you know, there's, the first there's rap nothing records, more rewarding than being proven wrong, right? I can't you wait. Know, to, I hope so. I hope so. The but I have to suffer through that awful <laughs> shit that's out. Like I was listening to Bad Bunny's new album because I have to because it's like I want to. I'm trying to fall in love with it. I'm like, okay. There's got to be something here, you know? Yeah, yeah. And um, the best thing about it is there's a group called Bombay Stereo who collaborated with him on a song. And uh, and I was I was relieved to see someone else on, on the song. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I can listen to this because someone else is involved. That's not a good thing, you know? 
that we'll we'll just be blasting solid uh, reggaeton the whole drive up to Flagstaff. <laughs> right. Yeah, and back, can't wait. And back the. Um, we, <laughs> right. I, I should tell people that we fiesta. are about to embark on the. I don't want. I, I'm not saying this a as meth, a, a, a I'm, uh, Yeah, I'm not saying this <laughs> as a as a pejorative. The but this is a pretty gay trip that we're about <laughs> to do. The uh, Roberto just d- drove in from L.A. in a rented Tesla. Hey, it's okay. It's okay. And we're going up to Sedona yep. and Flagstaff. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. The we'll. We'll talk matching about, matching on Tinder along the way. <laughs> we'll we'll talk about our feelings. Yeah. The um pick up some vibrations in Sedona. Or no, it's not it's not gay. We're just the white women. That's that's what we are. We're the, <laughs> this is... we're Othelmo and Luigi. <laughs> that's that's our we should get matching tattoos. That's that was that was truly vile. <laughs> that was really terrible. That I was when I said when we were like getting ready to do the podcast, and I was like ready spaghetti. I sent that, and then I was like, "Oh, this is hideously offensive. Oh, come this on. is like a, the, a uh, you know slur against you know the no, Roberto's going to come in and be like, you know, my father's you know part spaghetti. I'm, like, how dare you? The I'm immune to that stuff. Really, the, I, you can offend the shit out of me. I don't care. <laughs> I'll I'll try and do that on the drive. Yeah, do it. Do it. The um, so let's talk about. Let's talk about Book of Gucci. The House because, of Gucci. House of Gucci. The um, I always muff something big <laughs> in every podcast, and I'm like, you know, a Book uh, of Gucci sounds great. It's like the, a cross between Book of Eli and and House of Gucci. <laughs> When I, I I kept introducing people and uh, you know we get the sort of the details of and we're like no man I I never played guitar in that band I'm the drummer you know I was like oh <laughs> fuck how do, you know the um so that's great apologies the there's a great there's a great uh, viral video of John Cusack being interviewed by this like 20 year old girl journalist and uh, she she was like oh you were so good in that movie Rain Man or whatever and he's like what she's like yeah you're you're in that right <laughs> he's like no. <laughs> And then she and then she picks another movie he's not in, like she completely fucked she completely fucking wrong the, got the wrong guy like she thought she was wow. interviewing someone else you know the anyway uh, Roberto Benini talking about the Gucci Hotel yeah the, <laughs> <laughs> right with, with Luigi the um, how I'm as somebody who's friends with you I'm interested in in your, your personal trajectory there yeah from. Um, from getting that project, doing the work, the the hopes you had for it, the excitement you felt, mm-hmm. the you know, I remember you know seeing it announced and being like, "Holy shit!" You know the, and then you know watching it with this subtext of uh, like glee, oh, thanks. you know, yeah. of um, holy shit, yeah. you know the. So I don't know. Tell me, tell me the whole process. You know. Um, how did you get that job? How was it for you to to go from um, trying professionally, mm-hmm. you know, just trying and trying and trying and trying, and then getting a thing, fucking doing a thing, making the thing, you know? Yeah. So, um, I will say this: uh, I was very lucky throughout my life and career. That to be able to do writing, to write screenplays for a living and never have to do anything else. Mm -hmm. And it was never like, um, you know, when I got hired on all these different projects, um, they paid well, they were very legitimate gigs. The fact that they never got made was almost like the, you know, the coda to the the whole thing. It wasn't, Mm -hmm. I never felt like, oh shit, I'm a failure because the movie didn't happen. Um, Also because I was speaking to other people uh, and within the sort of the, the circle of screenwriting friends, this was so common. Yeah. Um, my frustration was the fact that I knew I was writing good stuff, and I knew that some of not necessarily my friends, but some of the the people that got movies made were writing garbage. And I was like, "How the fuck is this happening? Like, my stuff, you know, regardless of whether it's it's genius or not, it's like it's a lot better than of some of the other things that were getting made, you know." And so. There was definitely a part of me that was I was getting very frustrated, and um, and also I was getting very close. That's the other thing. It's like oh, that's that's almost worse. Well, than... yeah, because like with the eel, you know, we had uh, Sam Rockwell attached, we had Ben Kingsley, we, I was uh, meeting Chris Evans a lot. I, like we had all these amazing people, which legitimizes the the work. But then at the end, 
it was always like the horse was was afraid to jump over the the whatever it is the obstacle yeah, yeah. you know um are, are are people going back and looking at, at yeah. the eel now like, oh yeah i mean I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second it's just it's funny but um you know with with gucci uh ridley scott and his wife had been trying to make that movie for 20 years um you know they had all these writers come in and out they spent four million dollars in development on that movie which is insane wow. and none of the writers none of the scripts landed they were just not they weren't satirical enough they were uh, very dry um they didn't find the humor in the story which i think to me is is grotesque the story is <laughs> grotesque the characters yeah. are grotesque and so they basically after 20 years they were almost ready to give up on it and the president of that company of ridley scott's company is somebody that has always championed my work and that's what i mean about like it didn't just sort of come out of nowhere it was always like you know the stuff that i wrote that didn't get made still brought me to a place where you know someone like ridley scott's producing partner saw something and was like okay let's give this guy a shot um so i i don't regret the years of frustration i think they were an inevitable part of my of my journey um and so with ridley you know we just we started talking about it and he had nothing to lose uh, i had nothing to lose um mm -hmm. they paid me very little money i went off i wrote the script in two months which is nothing i gave it to them three weeks went by after i sent it and i didn't hear anything and i thought that's it that's the he, worst there goes another one yeah and uh and he, his wife called me and she was on speakerphone, and she goes, Robbie, because she speaks Italian. Uh -huh. Robbie, uh, Ridley's here with me. And he just grabs the phone. He's like, you fucking nailed it. Ah. He goes, you fucking nailed it. I want to make this. Even saying it, I'm getting goosebumps. Yeah, it's amazing, um, dude. And uh, And I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. And then, you know, I flew over from New York to Los Angeles and stayed with Mark. And he was very happy. Yeah, uh, obviously. And, yeah, he um, was he was sort of keeping me posted as this was developing. And yeah, he, and, you know, he said, "I'm very excited for oh, my friend." Yeah, him and Shelley were always very, uh, you know, very supportive with everything, and so um, it's it's nice when you know when you can finally give somebody good news rather than like bum bum around again. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so yeah, so we did some work on the script with Ridley, um, and then and then we waited for Lady Gaga, which took five months, and that mm -hmm. was a whole process. And you know, it's crazy because until the day that I was on set, literally watching the movie get shot, I still was very reluctant to uh, to celebrate because yeah. I had been there before. I had seen yeah. how one one small fucking glitch can cause the whole house of cards to crumble. And so, when people were like, "Oh my god, you've got to be, you've got to feel so happy," you know, let's go out, let's celebrate. I was like, "No, no, no, like." Let's wait till the movie's finished, wrapped, edited, mm -hmm. and then we can fucking celebrate, you know? Um, but so, yeah, the Lady Gaga wait was actually the worst part about it because there was a moment after Ridley came on where we couldn't get a hold of her. She she was, wow. I don't know if she was busy or she was taking a break, but, you know, he was starting to look at other scripts. He was starting to look at other projects. She, she was fantastic. She was amazing. She, uh, yeah. I mean, so good. She's an amazing, amazing artist. Yeah, uh, and I mean that with a capital I, A. I, you know, I, I. She's friends of friends in New York, and the you know, and her music has been inescapable. The um, that said, you know, I, I'm not like um, a fan. I don't have I don't have issues with it. Yeah, um, but it, but it doesn't do much for You're me. You're not a little monster. The, uh, well, you're a big monster. I'm, well, I'm an extra large <laughs> monster. The um, but she, she, hell of an actress and yeah. just incredible stage presence and um, you know, really magnetic. Like I couldn't not look at her. Yeah. You know? Well, she evaporates, uh, uh, creativity. She's, uh, she's game. I mean, that's the thing, you know, she's just always, yeah, she's always, uh, playing and, and you can tell that her wheels are spinning 24 seven. Um, so whether it's film, music, uh, dance, whatever it is, she's always just going to, Go for it, and uh, that's that's what you want out of people doing this. You don't want people who are going to shit their pants or, you know, be be annoying and difficult. And who know. who was the first person you called after you got the call from um, from Ridley Scott and his wife? 
Uh, probably my landlord in Brooklyn Heights who was about to evict me. Ah, <laughs> you didn't call like your mother or the. I used it as a chip in the negotiation. <laughs> You're like, listen, motherfucker. Yeah, I brought you cutlery. I have a new and now I'm bringing you this. <laughs> I have a new guarantor. Um, no, it, it was definitely my parents, and then it was, um, you know, it was the usual. It was usual people. It was my my best friends. Uh, it was my, you know, the film, film people that I work with, whether it was agent, lawyer, all that stuff. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it came out in the press. So a lot of people read about it. And, um, and again, I just really, I was very humble, not, not humble. It's weird to say you're humble because that makes you unhumble, un- unhumble, right? I was, I was reluctant. I just didn't want to talk yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, uh, I, mean, I the, didn't want to jinx it. You know? Yeah. The, in the work that we do, um, if you if you if you leak to your friends or if you leak to a small group of people that Mark Lanigan is going to produce your next record, mm-hmm. inevitably he doesn't do it. It's not going to happen. Well, you that's know, the, true. And the more people you tell, the more likely and the cooler the thing is, the more excited you are. Yeah. The you know I mean I I've had a couple of projects where you know the my agent or my contact on the project was like no this is definitely going to happen i guarantee this is yeah. and the more assurances they give you you're just like this is fucking I mean bullshit. listen the the movie that um that i was about to make in the fall that the director pulled out of that was to me the most cer- certain thing i had going um and that is now very uncertain and the other three things that were my review mirror that i wrote pre gucci you know, two of them just got bought for me to direct. Mm-hmm. And there's another thing that I'm doing. And, you know, so it's like you can't really tell uh, what's going to go and what's not going to go. And that's what I mean about bulldozing your way through. I mean, you just have to pick yourself up immediately and keep moving, you know? It's tricky being an artist because, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we talk about is the work being its own reward. You have to provide your own validation. You have to be able to go back and, you know, there's, uh, Aziz Ansari had this thing about, um, you know, going to Kanye's house and Kanye was like sitting on his couch listening to, to the new record. And he was like, yo, this fucking slams, you yeah. know? And it's funny cause anything Kanye does is funny. That is the, funny. Um, but you need to be your own fan. You need to be an advocate for your own work. You need to be able to look back at a thing that you've written or a thing that you've recorded and say, this is good. Yeah. You know, I like this, you know, the, they didn't get it, but I get it, you yeah. know? And so it, it does, you do need, the work needs to be the reward. You need to, to provide your own validation for the work you've done. You need to enjoy what you've created. And also we have no fucking idea what's going to work and what's not going to work. Right. You know, the, my two biggest songs were throwaways mm-hmm. where I was like, well, I need another song for the record and I don't have one. I guess I'll put this turkey on. Yeah. And then, you know, it just goes to show that we have no idea the merits of our own work. Oh, for sure. I mean, there's a lot of stories like that of people that just come up with random random songs uh, and, and they, they turn out to be their most iconic. Yeah. But um, no, with film, the only thing is it's a little different in the sense that you have to have a uh, an operation behind you you have to have a a machine and they all have to think that what you're doing is is pretty okay i mean of course there's this a part of it that is very cynical and money oriented and you know you can write a goddamn turd but if it has enough explosions in it it'll get made and and it's definitely not aiming at being anything other than uh you know I do like explosions. Filler. I love them too. <laughs> okay, good. I have a few. I the, have a few that. Uh, yeah, the next, you know, the next screenplay you write. Can you put more explosions I, in that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have actually. Yeah, I have a really great explosion uh, in this new thing in uh, in a Detroit crack den. Oh, good. That's, so, that's do exactly. Wanna, do you want to be in it? Oh, dude, are you kidding? That's fucking <laughs> explosions in a Detroit crack den. That's like a, a line. That's, by the way, that's the title of the movie. A line drive through the middle of all my interests. It's called Explosions in a Detroit crack den. <laughs> It's for Netflix. Um, Netflix. <laughs> so, yeah, man. Um, just uh, the whole thing of, of moving forward and um, and also just not being too uh, precious, um, you know, because some of the stuff, like some of the stuff that I wrote in the past that is now being revisited, it's just, it was just a matter of time. And, and it's just, it's human nature. You know, people are going to believe in you more when, Ridley Scott believed in you, yeah, or or whoever, and 
and it's just it's sheepish and it's and it's weak and it's cowardly <laughs> but it is what it is and i'm it, it, certainly yeah. not going to you know uh to to be a to try and talk those people out of it of course like, not yeah i mean yeah. i'm not going to be a white knight for, for it's, the cowards <laughs> it's funny too to after you've you know quote unquote made it or after you've had that first big break after you've gotten out of the quagmire and like into actually like walking on dry ground i still drive a fiat 500 the <laughs> You, you've seen what I drive, bro. Yeah. The uh, you can you can look back and be and then you can see. Oh, it was all part of the process. You know, all those failures were um, not failures, but I was practicing right. to you know, or I was preparing for this or whatever. But when you're in the middle of it, man, yeah, it's you know, it's you're just like this. I'm just going to be like treading water in a fucking septic tank for the rest of my life. You yeah, know? that's true. Yeah, but um I'm lucky now that you know the 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 next two things that I'm doing one of them I wrote the other one is an adaptation of a novel that I l- adore um and another thing is another thing that I wrote. So it feels like um at least it's my own stuff. Yeah. You know, and um of course I was I was sent a lot of stuff to look at that I was just like there's no way. I mean it was you know because that now I'm the Italian fashion writer. So I was getting, you know, which is really funny. I was getting all these like <laughs> stories about Italians or about fashion. Well, it's uh, especially funny considering your uh, black. Actually, or, I changed my socks. You changed your socks. You yeah, wussed yeah. out. The you're wearing like <laughs> like black, like black thigh high socks. Tube socks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was <laughs> with what, suspenders. white sneakers. I was wearing suspenders. A uh, barrel in Arizona. The uh, tutu. <laughs> <laughs> the right. snorkeling mask. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah this is this is uh i mean i'm trying to fit in here <laughs> i mean i i googled uh what do arizonans wear and this is what showed up so arizona is such a fucking shit show man yeah uh, it's a strange it's a strange place i don't know but i'm 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 definitely looking forward to uh sort of dragging you out and about through a couple of the i mean i'm excited um, man you know from the i don't know truck stops to uh, you know, alkaline water in Sedona and stuff yeah. like that. It's really, it's just the whole spectrum. Of, I mean, California is like that too. There's like the inland white, oh, white power, methy part of California. Incredibly varied. And then there's the, you know, breath, the breath of Farians. Yeah. <laughs> the, um, I always find, um, I, I find most things fascinating. I love Arizona. And one of the things that I love about it is that it feels like a fallen world. Yeah. You know, what, and I was going to say before I forget, like what's your, um, what do you think is your gift as a writer? Like, what's the thing that you have as a writer that you feel like makes you good at it? I, I mean, I think the, I think the only, the only gift that I have is honesty, you know, mm. of, um, you know, being able to look in the mirror and describe my life and my my grotesque body in minute hideous detail, Mm -hmm. you know, of the, I I feel like, you know, when you do the slow motion thing on your iPhone and it's in sort of like at regular speed and then it slows down and you see, you know, for me, it's always cat videos. So like I watch my (laughs) cat like running cross legged and like the, that's how, um, bad shit unfolds in my life and in my memory yeah. in that when things start going bad, when a fight breaks out in a bar or, or, you know, the, or there's an accident or violence or, you know, um, everything slows down and mm. I really, I can really sort of see everything, remember everything. And the, you know, I don't, I don't want to say I'm unafraid to write about it cause I, I I am I'm totally afraid. we were talking about this you know earlier the when people know you're a writer they're like oh what's the best thing you wrote today and I'm like yeah. I've, I I I didn't write anything yet today I didn't write anything yesterday I, if if everything goes well I won't write anything tomorrow either That's I fucking exactly I hate I the feel. shit the and the stories that I have to tell right now you know, you know two stories that are weighing on me they are fucking ugly stories and I don't yeah. I don't want to go back there and I don't want to spend Do time people with ask it. you what's your uh, uh, inspiration all the time? <laughs> Do you get that? All the time. What inspires you to write? I don't like uh What what's uh, your answer? Well, a deadline and money. <laughs> it's the truth, man. <laughs> and and, and that is and that is 
and and those are legit motivations. Yeah, that, and and that is a real artist because the and Lanigan Lanigan could fucking do that. Mm. Of just we have two hours to write a song. Yeah. Uh, and and that's what real artists do is you just you have to be able to turn it on and be like, okay let's go you know I mean that? I don't believe in writer's block I think everybody has writer's block just naturally it's 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 you know fear it's fear of writing yeah um, and you should have that and uh, you know <laughs> we want to encourage people in their fear of writing to never never write anything yeah. we're trying to dismantle the writing uh, community I <laughs> from within I had a fan write to me and say, hey, you know, this isn't for me, but for a friend of mine, you know, he's really struggling as a writer, you know, could you write him a message of encouragement? Yeah. And I was like, in every way, no. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely not. Yeah. I don't know this person. This isn't cameo. Maybe he's a terrible writer. Maybe he's a horrible person. Maybe he's a fucking monster. You know, I don't know this person. And I'm, you know, the... Um, you need to, you need to inspire yourself. You need to encourage yourself. Mm -hmm. If you make something good, I won't be able to prevent myself from telling you, holy fucking shit. That's so good. Right. The, but it's, it's the amazing thing about comedy is that it relies on, um, an unconscious response. Uh, people don't decide to laugh. It's something that happens to us. Yeah, it's an instinctive and that's, reaction. That's you know, if you're um, if you're asking for encouragement, it's like the um, can you pretend to laugh at this joke? You know, mm. um, so no, just make something fucking amazing. Put it somewhere where I can't avoid seeing it or experiencing it, and then I. I won't I won't be able to not respond. Right. You know, if because I do believe in that shit. I have, you know, I mean we both do. We absolutely believe in the, you know, the transformative power of storytelling and writing and oh, for sure. the um I know your work has changed your life, yeah. you know. Yeah. The like Lanigan's work, you know, changed both of our lives. For sure. The we still very much believe in it. The but um I don't know. I I feel like if you need your hand held through it, you should look into doing something else. Yeah, I had a I had a situation with with someone that was very strange because um it's it's like what I was saying earlier about, you know, if you're not good at something, you should probably just not do it. And um and that was that was a situation with this person that, you know, he kept showing me work that he was doing, writing, uh directing shorts, stuff like that. And there was nothing in there that made me feel like he should continue doing it. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's tough. It's like, what do you do? I mean, do you, do you tell that person pick something else? And and that's very arrogant. Right. But, but at the same time, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to lie to them. You don't want to sort of be like, um, the best thing I could do was to tell him to go to writing school. And he didn't do that. Mm. And he was like, Oh no, I don't need to do that. I can just read a bunch of books. So there was also an element of, of naivety and arrogance. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I think with with ninety percent of people, you can tell. Like you, you know, it's like a musician. The moment they pick up an instrument, uh, or they sing, or or whatever it is, or whether it's even sports, you know, soccer. The way I can't fucking juggle a ball. I'm probably not going to be a. I'm also thirty nine. I'm probably not going to you know play for for an Italian national team. But it's just a you know a gift. Either you have it or you don't. At the end of the day, you know. The also. I'm hard pressed to recall the kind things that people have said to me or the encouraging things that people have said to me. But I, I remember clearly I worked for uh, Robert Criscow, who was known as the Dean oh, of the Rock, rock Critic. The Rock yeah. Critic, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I disagree worked, with most of the things he writes. I, I, I worked as an, well, good, because I worked as an intern for him. And um, at one point I, I just was like, okay, you've got to give him a CD of your stuff. Yeah. And I did. And there was that three weeks went by yeah. three weeks of agony where you're waiting. And I was finally, I was like, Hey Bob, did like, did you have a chance to listen to that CD? Yeah. And he turned to me and he said, Mishka, you can't sing at all. <laughs> like two, di- two separate sentences. And the, and it hurt. Oh, no. And it, it, you know, because, 
um, I, I loved his work. I loved his writing. I loved his taste. And I felt like here it is. This is, um, the nail in the coffin. Well, this is, this is a voice of authority. This is God saying, yeah, nope. And that put fucking fire in my belly. Mm. You know, the, because Grant, I am not Bob Dylan, but that's also the same thing that they said to Dylan. That's true. You know, and well, the, and and ninety percent of punk bands yeah, couldn't sing. All my favorite singers can't sing. Yeah, you know the and if you if you looked at the the way that the Lanigan sang and the you know his fucking chain smoking and a mouthful of chewing tobacco, yeah. sitting down to record any vocal coach would be like, "Fuck no, just do you know, do he, the opposite of everything you're doing." Yeah. But the but I asked he him did, about his vibrato technique once. Oh yeah, because he had an amazing vi- vibrato. Yeah, and. uh and he was like, I just, I just do it. I don't even, I was like, did you, I, I asked him, I was like, have you ever taken a singing lesson, Mark? And he, he laughed. I can't, he I can't believe you got away with fucking asking him questions like that. Yeah. Oh, dude, I asked him so many <laughs> questions that I was like, should I ask this? Yeah. I hope in the fuck car yeah. on the way back, you're like, well, what the fuck did I just do? Yeah. Well, that's the thing. I, I, I was quite disarming in my honesty. Yeah. And curiosity, um, but yeah. So I asked him about the singing lessons, and and he just laughed at me and was like, <laughs> "Fuck no, never." But he had, you know, he could he could do it. I mean, it was that's something that people go to school for, you know, to to develop yeah. that that vibrato technique. But um, I honestly the there were times where I theorized that he had like, you know an extra lung or, you know, how bullfrogs have that like flap of skin that they inflate. And then, you know, that there was something physiologically different about him. But you yeah, know, there was the, there was the way that Jimi Hendrix had something well, yeah. he had beautiful long hands. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, that's what I mean about the gift thing. It's like, it's just, uh, it goes beyond practicing and beyond believing in yourself. I think it's just genetics. It's, it's tricky, you know, because I I want to tell people it's hard work and it's practice and that's it. It's nothing else. And bo- and both of those things are necessary. Mm-hmm. Um but you do have to have something. Yeah, you I have agree. to have something and you have to sort of hon- work, you know, work and repetition and practice hones it and refines it and stuff. Yeah. But if there's nothing there, you can just keep working and work and keep getting, you know, it's the, like an asymptote, you know, you keep working and working and almost getting good and almost getting good. And each time you make less progress towards the goal and never actually get there. I yeah. I used to book bands in Brooklyn and I would listen to these CDs where I was like, man, this is so close to being good and it sucks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, because it sounded like everything else or yeah, the, um, you know, if, if the, if if something sucks in every way, it's memorable. Yeah. And if something is very close to being good without ever actually being good, it's completely forgettable. I think the the most the most tragic and depressing cases are the ones of people that are very gifted and do the work and don't get there. And uh, yeah. and I'm starting to see there's there's definitely someone uh from from my school from my from Colombia mm-hmm. that we we all looked up to he was he was brilliant you know and uh, he's just it's not happening for him and and it's crazy it's like you know why um and you can't i mean there's nothing there's no, not a scientific formula to it but it is it's like you know kind of a cruel cr- cruel joke um uh, Maybe this is a good one thing to to walk on the the elephant tattoo. Um, it started as an elephant uh, for my sister, mm-hmm. you know, so that so that she would know that I was committed to um, to repairing our relationship and to n- never let it get as bad again as it got. But yeah. um, the it's also uh, Ganesh, who is the remover of obstacles. Wow, the because. Uh, for so much of my life, I felt like I was plagued by obstacles, mm-hmm. and you know, and in hindsight, the there were obstacles that I was putting up. Right, of course. You know the, and I still do that. That it didn't go away when I quit drinking, mm-hmm. but well, um, you find new ones. Yeah, 
you yeah, make you the, make new new ones for yourself. Yeah, it's like um, you know, cl- cleaning your ho- spending all day cleaning your house to to fucking throw a party, <laughs> tra- <laughs> trash it again. Yeah. The um, well, let's get out of here. Let's head up to uh, for our th- Thelma and Luigi. Yeah, our, our Th- Thelma and Luigi. Our our uh, wild Ro- road trip shenanigans. If they don't, uh, if if nobody hears from us, they should probably call the cops. Yeah. The, well, no, don't call the cops. No. <laughs> call, call, who, who do they call? Call. I don't know. We'll we'll get a fixer. All right. <laughs> the, um. Thank you so much for for com- coming out here to visit me. Thank and you, for man. Doing it's this. great and to see you. The and hopefully we'll do. We'll go and get into some fucked up trouble and then have to do another podcast. Too. That sounds uh, great. Awesome. Thank you. Well, hi. Hello there. Um, my name is Cheeto. I am an adorable little uh, three legged puppy. And as you all know, uh, little adorable little three legged orphan puppies all care about quality podcasts. And uh, I want you all to know that I subscribe to the uh, the Patreon for the Mishka Shabali podcast, and you should too. It's the only thing I like more than kibble. Nom nom. Um, so please head on over to uh, patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. Sign up. There's all kinds of good uh, crap there. There's uh, writing advice and tips. There's published, unpublished stories. There's a bunch of demos. Um, a bunch of sort of loose dispatches from my life. I mean, his life. And uh, I don't know, just really good stuff that uh, adorable uh, three-legged orphan puppies named Cheeto really love. And you will too. So uh, patreon.com slash Mishka Shabali. All the proceeds will go to uh, puppy food for orphans or other things. Okay, thank you.